in one way or another, we are all feeling the healthcare crisis. But there is a bigger, more ominous threat. We are running out of doctors. Think about the last time you tried to get a doctor's appointment. Was it urgent? Have you ever had a doctor who left the practice? How long did it take for you to be seen? In the seacoast, we are lucky. The answer, maybe just a few days, but in most of the places, on average, the wait to see a doctor is about 30 days or longer. And it's about to get worse, much worse. There are 7,000 areas in the US that have healthcare professional shortages. Of these areas, two-thirds are rural. When we ask people in those areas, one out of four would say that they could not get the care they needed because the doctor's location was too far or too difficult to get to. In New Hampshire, we only have one-fifth of the primary care doctors that we need. One-fifth. The truth is that in the US, we only have half the number of doctors per thousand people that in most countries of similar economies. Could it get worse? Yes, it could. Unfortunately, it could. It is estimated that by 2025, in only three years, in only three years, we will see 75% of the healthcare workers leave their profession. Imagine that. We will have a deficit of more than 30,000 primary care providers. 30,000 primary care providers. And to make matters worse, the new census data revealed that by, in about 10 years, we will have more seniors than children in the US for the first time in history. And I have news for you. We are not getting any younger. <laughs> so who's going to take care of you? Or me? I am very worried about this. And I think that you should be very worried too. This is not good. So what's going on? How can we fix this? To try to explain and offer a solution, let's follow the path of a typical medical student. We'll call her Maria. Actually, Maria is her name. <laughs> Maria is kind and very bright. She loves working with people. She is a first generation college student. Her parents migrated from South America. Maria is one of 30,000 graduating doctors in the US this year. She was in a four year pre med track at a prestigious university. Then she went through a grueling selection process to get into medical school. Only the luckiest, the best, and the hardest workers even get in. About 40% only get in. How about graduating? One out of five don't graduate. You have to be smart, dedicated, and very determined. And it should be that way. After all, you'll be charged to taking care, preserving, protecting the health of your fellow humans. At this point, Maria has had eight years of education after high school. And like all her fellow grads, she is deeply in debt. Deeply in debt. But now she's a doctor, right? So she can get to work, pay back all that debt, doing what she has been trained to do, practice medicine. Well, not so fast. Despite being highly skilled, Maria and her fellow doctors cannot, are not allowed legally to place an IV, 
stitch a wound, or even prescribe an aspirin. In most of the countries, even countries of similar economies, medical school is shorter, less expensive, and you get a license to heal, to practice medicine, right after you graduate. Not here. To be able to work as a licensed physician in the United States, Maria must first go through a residency training program in a chosen specialty. Surgery, internal medicine, pediatrics, dermatology, you name it. As a resident, you have the privilege of working up to 80 to 100 hours a week for about 60 grand a year, making about $12 an hour. Brutal hours, by the way, brutal hours. But maybe for Maria, who has dreamed of becoming a doctor since she was three to four years old, this will all be okay. A final hurdle to achieving her dreams. Except to get a residency, you must go through what's called the match. And here is the bottleneck of us having enough doctors who can actually take care of us. The match is basically a lottery. Many more thousands apply to the match than there are residency positions open. So imagine that. Thousands apply and very few residency positions open. That means that every year, thousands of physicians are unmatched, being left forbidden to practice the career that they had trained for so long and so hard for. Despite the situation, the current regulations are very hard to reverse, mainly because of partisan politics and the exorbitant, astronomical cost of doing so. Even today, in 2022, these hurdles continue. Why? The simple answer might be that most people outside of the medical community are not aware of this bottleneck and its dire consequences. Yes, our country is deeply divided, but there is something that we all may agree on. We need more doctors, and we need them now. So Maria wants to become a surgeon. So she finds the best surgery programs, she sends the applications, and not just one or two, like the average medical student, she sends up to 70 applications. And by the way, the cost of these applications sum up to thousands of dollars. And remember, Maria is already deeply in debt. And then she waits. Meanwhile, the programs, the medical programs, they receive, sort, select, and reject the applications. Filters are set in place for grades, honors, achievements, your nationality, whether you're a native English speaker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Most of this process happens without any human intervention. It's automatic. The algorithm biases are real. Maria is actually lucky. She gets a few interviews. She goes, interviews, she feels good, she thinks that went well, so now she has to wait. In March, she and her fellow grads will get an email. Maybe, congratulations, you matched. Or maybe the dreaded, we regret to inform you. That day could be the best or the worst day in her life. If she selected, Maria, on the third Friday in March, will get a letter letting her know where she matched, which program selected her. Could be anywhere, but at this point, Maria would be grateful to get anything, to get something. So she would accept, she would pack her bags, say goodbye to friends and family, and go. Life is about to get good. Unfortunately, 
Maria, like 2,000 of her fellow grads, didn't get good news. She did not match. That means that she has to go into what's called the scramble or the SOAP, the Supplemental Offer Acceptance Program. These programs attempt to fill any empty spots with the best possible leftover candidates. From the hospital's perspective, the programs, they attempt to fill any spots. They want no empty spots. Their young doctors are already way overworked. They're almost burned out. And they can't afford to run the hospital without these residents. From Maria's perspective, and with a debt of $400,000 or so, she wants to get anything. She would think that she wants to be a surgeon, but who cares if she wants to be a surgeon? At this point, she will take anything, a family practice opening. It's not what she likes, but at this point, she really, really needs a job. She is part now of a revolving group of 11,000 chronically unmatched physicians, graduated physicians who are prohibited, forbidden, not allowed to work. Imagine if we spread that number across 50 states. Every state, New Hampshire, will get 220 brand new physicians. So I don't want to paint an awful picture of the US medical education system. We have amazing academic programs, community teaching programs that provide some of the best teaching and care in the world. We train some of the best specialists, no doubt about that. But what about the doctors that we aren't training? The doctors left unmatched, like Maria. There is a better way. In many countries, from Europe to Latin America, from Canada to Finland to Venezuela, the system is very, very different. In those places, medical education, medical school is subsidized, free or very inexpensive. So upon graduation, those young doctors, those young doctors basically start working in what they were trained to do, paying a debt to society, working as doctors. Working as doctors for one or two years in underserved or rural communities. After that, they can go to do, choose a specialty to practice on. These recent grads, in a supervised fashion, become the backbone of the country's healthcare system. I did that right after medical school. There's no doubt that that experience made me a much better doctor than being forced to pursue a residency in a specialty that I wasn't interested in. So I dream, I propose that we adopt such a system. For the heck of Maria and all those aspiring doctors, inspiring doctors, but most importantly, for the heck of those patients who can't seem to get care, health care, I dream. Imagine those doctors out in our underserved communities across America, providing timely care with expertise, compassion, and empathy. I dream. 
the pandemic has really proven that our healthcare needs fixing. The inequity, the unfairness, the bias to access to healthcare is real. Remember, here in Portsmouth, we are blessed in so many ways. Maybe the wait to see a doctor is not too long. Maybe we have choices. But in many other places in the country, like in most of the world, things are very different. A long, long wait to see a doctor, or maybe no doctor to see at all. I believe we could adopt such a system. We must. And maybe Maria can be your primary care doctor. She will gladly take you as a new patient right away. And believe me, Maria will be the best doctor that you ever had. Thank you very much. <laughs>